safer cultures. So on the 1st of January, every year, people make New Year's resolutions. And many of those are around choices to become healthier in the following year. We know that many people don't actually keep to those resolutions, but they do make them. Underneath it though, there is the desire to become healthier and the knowledge that that's a good thing. And in this week's session, we're going to look at becoming healthier, safer Christian cultures. So what are the hallmarks of that? And how does your Christian culture match up to those? What are the things you're doing really well? And what are the things that you might want to do a bit better? Underlying everything is a commitment to safeguarding within our cultures. It's a foundation on which everything else is built. Good safeguarding policy and practice really does matter. And so we need to make sure that that's established and maintained. In terms of creating healthy Christian cultures, or indeed any healthy culture, valuing, respecting and nurturing people is key. To me, this is one of the most important elements. So you know when you're respected, you know when you are valued as an individual, and you know when you are supported. And some of this is around reflecting on our own behaviour. How do we treat one another? How do we speak to one another? How do we speak about one another? And how do we nurture and respect each other through the way in which we behave, the way in which we speak, the things that we do? All of these matter in creating healthier cultures. We also want to focus on biblical teaching. A focus on healthy Christian cultures is not a move away from biblical teaching. It's actually something that recognises the role and importance of biblical teaching within our communities. But we want to guide and empower people. We want teaching that helps people to understand scripture, but also understand what it might have to say. And there's certainly plenty of biblical passages about treating each other with respect, about loving and valuing each other. So it's really important that as we move through this session, we don't lose the fact that we are a Christian community and that part of that is biblical teaching. It's also really important to think about leadership. How do we nurture those who lead us? There's lots of work that suggests that many Christian leaders feel burnt out or worn out or not supported. So we need to think about how we build leadership within our context, which is supported and where leaders are cared for and where they are supported in all the activities that is, are expected of them. We might also want to ask ourselves questions about not just paid leadership, but all the different leadership roles within our Christian context. How do we support people? What training do we offer people? We may put somebody in a position of leadership because they're particularly gifted with a group, but then we may not support them in developing skills of managing conflict, leading teams, etc. We do expect an awful lot of our leaders. We often expect them to be all things to all people. And it really is important for us to reflect on how we speak to and about and communicate with our leaders at all levels. But it's also important that if you're a leader, your role and responsibility is to nurture, care for and respect those that you're leading. We do need to lead without coercion, without control. We need to lead, lead carefully, to be aware of the differences that each other bring to situations and to lead in a way that ensures that the people that we're leading know that we value them, that we respect them and that we want to support them. So in a healthy Christian culture, it works both ways that we are supporting our leaders and in turn we are being supported and nurtured by them. In a healthy culture as well, we value whole life service. Sometimes in our churches, we value what happens within our church context, the ministries that roll out of our churches, but we don't value so much the nine to five work that many of our congregations do. We don't value the work of retired people in the community we don't potentially value those who are staying at home looking after young children. And if we want to move to a healthier culture, we need a culture which values everything and all of the input that all of our members are having throughout their lives week to week. 
It was a really good test to ask yourself, if people just come to your Sunday services, what does that tell them that you value? Because often we only pray for those people who are going abroad or who are engaged in our church ministries. And a move to a healthier culture is a move that values all of life and the whole of life and all of the fantastic things that many of us are involved in throughout the week. A healthy culture also models healthy accountability. You can't get it right all the time. So what structures do we have in place to build accountability? Not a harsh accountability, not an accountability that requires too much of us, but accountability that is able to ask questions and to think about decisions that have been made and in which people might operate as a team and where they might be responsible for their actions but also supported within that. A healthy culture models inclusion. We are a very diverse people. We come from all sorts of backgrounds, with all sorts of experiences, with all sorts of differences, and that's the beauty of this community. But how do we model inclusion? How does everybody feel valued and included? There are many ways in which you can feel marginalised in communities, Christian communities, or any community. How do we model something that looks different? How do we ensure that everyone that comes in knows that they're valued, everybody feels respected? That's what healthy inclusion looks like, where we value diversity and we model that acceptance of one another. It doesn't mean we might not challenge behaviours at times, but even how we do that really matters. So a healthy culture, modelling inclusion. You might want to ask yourself the question, how far the culture that you're part of does that currently? And finally, a culture in which we guide behaviour, but we respect choice. Actually, the truth of the matter is that the whole of faith is a choice. We make a choice at some point, a decision in our life, and it is a choice. So we can't be in a situation where people are not allowed to have any choice about their behaviour. So we guide behaviour, but we respect choice. Of course, there might be consequences to different choices. But there is something about autonomy and respecting people's choices that really, really matters. We should be cultures where it's okay to ask questions. It's all right to raise issues. That if we don't agree, we can say that we don't agree, but the way we say it really matters. I often say in training sessions that we will remember the process much more than we will ever remember the product of any decision we make as Christian communities. So how we treat each other overall really, really matters. In, in a book in this area that I've written with a colleague, Justin Humphreys, one of the questions that he asks is, what stories do people tell about your church? What church stories do you tell one another? That's a really good question for you to ask. It might be a good question for you to think about how easy it is to ask questions and to disagree or to raise issues within your culture. How do you model inclusion? So it would be really useful for you to be able to use some of these checklist hallmarks to think about the things that you're doing really well and celebrate them, but also to be honest about the areas perhaps which you want to improve in, where, which are not being modelled currently. And really, underneath all of this, there is a question about how do we treat one another? How do we speak to and about one another in our Christian com communities? And if we can reflect on that, we can build towards a future where our cultures are healthier and safer for all.